Welcome, everyone. Hello, I'm Allison Sanders, co-director of Wilton Historical. Welcome to our presentation today, Energy Efficiency and the Historic House with Marina Wisniewski and Todd Levine of the State Connecticut State Preservation Office, known to most as SHPO. We are presenting this program today in partnership with Wilton Go Green. Just a bit about Wilton Go Green. They are a local nonprofit that has been educating residents in Wilton and beyond on topics such as recycling, food waste, renewable energy, sustainable living, and of course, energy efficiency for the past 12 years. Wilton Go Green has taken the lead in recertifying the town of Wilton for a sustainable Connecticut certification, which awards communities who support state goals of climate change mitigation, waste reduction, and open space acquisition. Today's presentation helps support the town's recertification. Wilton Historical has the honor and cost of caring for 18 carefully preserved antique structures. Recent sky high energy bills have not been timed to the budget. It is clear that efficiencies need to be found for us and for you that respect the architectural features, materials, and general appearance of our historic homes. Which brings us to our program. It's the age old adage, the greenest house is the one already built. Historic houses are inherently sustainable with features built in to capitalize on using and retaining energy. Historic houses can also be updated in appropriate ways to make them even more efficient, some of which you can do yourself. Today, we will learn helpful tips and see case studies to help owners save money on their bills, help the environment, and maintain their home all at the same time. We have two experts in the field who will present today. Morena Wisniewski serves as the State Register Coordinator for the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office, as well as an environmental reviewer and coordinator of the Women's and Minority History Trail. Prior to coming to Hartford, she was the Preservation and Public Engagement Officer at the Providence Hist Preservation Society, as well as a private consultant serving New York City. She holds an MS in Historic Preservation from Columbia University and an MA in World History from NYU. With a specific concentration in material sciences, she spends most of her free time researching building performance and arguing with window salesmen. I'd like to hear more about that. And Todd Levine. Todd is an architectural historian with a master's degree from the Savannah College of Art and Design in Georgia. Todd has worked at inspecting, studying, and preserving Connecticut's historic resources since 2003. Todd was the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation, now Preservation Connecticut, services officer from 2006 to 2009, and from 2009 to 2012, he was director of the Historic Barns of Connecticut program one of the most comprehensive barn programs in the nation. Todd has been at the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office as an architectural historian, Freedom Trail coordinator, and environmental reviewer since 2013. And finally, before we start our program, please stay on mute and type your questions in the chat at the bottom of the screen. The Q&A session will be at the end of the talk. And now I'll turn it over to Morena and Todd. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ron Burgundy. No, my name is Todd Levine <laughs> from the State Historic Preservation Office. And we're going to talk today about the inherent sustainability of historic homes. And I'm Marina Wisniewski from the State Historic Preservation Office, or as we like to be called, SHPO. It's a bit of a running joke when people talk about sustainable homes that they think of something that's either a tree or a hobbit's den. But in actuality, most historic homes were built to be efficient by design, and if they are maintained on a regular basis, are quite sustainable. Today, we're going to talk about some ways that you as a homeowner can improve the energy efficiency of your house. There is a lot of material that we're going to go through in a very short amount of time, so it's going to be fairly broad. But more in depth on each topic can be found on our website in our guide, Energy Efficiency for Historic Homes. And as with most things, it's good to start with a plan. In order to create that plan, we need to set out our goals. Any house, new or old, is a system. The parts all work together, sometimes effectively, sometimes ineffectively. 
It's important to remember this when you are thinking what you want to accomplish by making your home efficient. For most people, that will be lowering energy costs by reducing the amount of energy expended. In a house built prior to 1950, it is generally possible to improve energy efficiency by 30 to 40%, effectively making it as efficient as a conventional house that was built after the year 2000. For others, it's simply the idea of using existing resources to reduce the amount of waste that ends up in the landfills. It takes an estimated 20 to 30 years for a new building to compensate for the energy expended for its construction. Most historic buildings have already expended that several times over. And for some people, their goals for improving energy efficiency include keeping characteristics of their house that they love. Windows, doors, shutters, even radiators. Things that may have been told they would need to replace in order to make their house green. That is simply not the case. There are many ways to go about improving energy efficiency in a home and there is a lot of information offered. For historic homes, the ideal goal is to improve energy efficiency while maintaining a home's historic integrity. As each resource is unique, it's important, it's important to know your home before you prescribe any treatment. As we all know, historic properties come in many varieties, exhibiting, exhibiting uh, different character defining features. Something is character defining, a definition provided uh, by the National Park Service. If it is a visual aspect or physical feature that comprises the appearance of an historic building. Character defining elements include the overall shape of the building, its materials, craftsmanship, decorative details, interior spaces and features, as well as the various aspects of a site and its environment. This is a photo of 14 Charter Oak Place, a contributing resource to the Charter Oak Place Historic District in Harper. It's a two and a half story frame house built in 1876 for Charles H. Northam, a flour merchant. What would be considered some character defining features for this building? Anybody have any hands they wanna raise? Anybody? Okay, or well, type I'll, it in the chat. I'll, or type it in the chat. I'm not sure if we, everybody's muted, but um, you know, you have the Gothic tower, uh, bay windows, uh, clapboard, and the barge board with brackets, just to name a few. And these are all considered character defining uh, features. Some character defining features, while beautiful, are also practical and contribute to a home's passive efficiency. As an example, the shutters that most people now keep fixed in place were originally meant to be used to shield interior spaces from the sun, while also allowing breezes to pass through. Deep covered porches serve a similar purpose. Steep, dark colored roofs with little overhang are characteristic to many 18th century New England houses because of their ability to effectively shed snow and attract heat for warmth. As fuel was an ever pressing concern for people who had previously been accustomed to mostly rainy winters, Homes were designed to maximize heat retention from the roof line to the plan, which in the 18th century often centered the heat source in the middle of the structure, allowing heat to radiate out to each room. The vestibule was also a tool of temperature regulation as an intermediary space between the outside and the inside. The siting of a residence and treatment of the lot was also important. Northern eleva elevations typically had few windows and were planted with coniferous trees like uh, pine or blue fir to protect against northern winds in winter. Conversely, southern elevations usually contained more windows with deciduous trees that shaded the house in summer and allowed solar heat in winter. Perhaps the most obvious passive energy fish, uh, feature that many people in their homes have is double hung windows. So a pop seventh grade science question, does hot air rise or fall? And uh, if you think it rises, uh, raise your hand. Well, spoiler alert, it rises. <laughs> so double hung windows allow for each sash to operate independently. And by lowering the upper sash and raising the lower sash, hot air near the top of the room migrates out as cooler air migrates in from the bottom de facto air conditioning. All right, building on existing features like these, it is entirely possible to improve a home's energy efficiency without adversely impacting its historic fabric. Some of the most effective energy improvement techniques are reversible 
and as a re uh, added bonus, relatively inexpensive. But before making any changes, it's a good idea to schedule an energy audit, which will help determine what changes to make, if any. Part of the energy assessment will be a blower door diagnostics test, which will depressurize the house and help determine where air and energy is being lost. The main benefit to an energy audit is to establish a baseline for energy performance so that any changes can be evaluated for their effectiveness. It is important to prepare for an energy audit ahead of time, as it will include the entirety of the structure, attic to basement, so keep the following things in mind. Energy audit checklist. So here's an example of items that to do before an energy audit. Most of this is because of the blower to a door test and it's meant to prevent anything hazardous from being circulated through the house. So the technician will also ask questions to help determine any specific areas of concern. So you may want to familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with things such as the year the house was built, total square footage, age of appliances and utilities, and if you notice any cold or hot spots. Usually, the results of an energy audit offer some immediate, simple ways to improve efficiency. One that doesn't impact the house at all and should be the first step is to replace incandescent bulbs with LEDs. Even in homes where lighting may play an important part in the feeling of spaces, new advances in lighting provides for a variety of brightness settings and color temperature. Another is to simply conserve electricity by turning things off when they're not in use or installing timers. Uh, yet another is to regulate thermostats. You dads know all about this. And I was gonna say something about the last uh, uh, statement too is uh, my kids always leave stuff on and I'm always walking around, turning them off. So, um, and my wife does too. So, you know, it's not just the kids here, but uh, all of us together can work uh, together to make this a little better. Uh, so for plumbing, fixing leaks and insulating pipes are some of the easiest methods uh, to eliminate energy waste. And once a baseline is established, a homeowner can begin to plan for interventions through a variety of methods. We're quickly, quickly going to go through all of those methods and point out ways a homeowner can improve energy efficiency on their own and some treatments that may require professional assistance. So air sealing. Correcting air leaks provides one of the greatest returns on investment. It is inexpensive and if done correctly, reversible. Air leaks can account for anywhere between five and 40% of heating and cooling costs. So it's important to detect where, is and where air is entering and exiting. The blower test as part of the energy audit helps to detect those air leaks, but homeowners can also test for leaks themselves by using a candle or a smoke test. Usually air leaks are found in the following areas. On the exterior, corners, outdoor faucets and utility inputs, joints between sidings and chimneys, joints between foundations and siding materials, and door and window frames. On the interior, the list is a little longer, but it's a similar sort of concept. Attic doors and hatches, attic and basement floors, vents, corners, window frames, door frames, baseboards, fireplace dampeners, wall or uh, mounted air conditioners, any sort of cable or phone line connections, dryer vents, you get the idea. When sealing air leaks, material is important. The goal is to have it be reversible. Latex caulking is often the most inexpensive and user-friendly option, and as an added bonus, can be painted. While spray foam is sometimes recommended for sealing spaces, it is not preservation friendly, it can stain, it does off-gas, and it can mask other problems such as mold. Usually the most effective areas to seal are the attic and the basement, both places where the majority of air enters and leaves the house. Other places to seal include around windows and doors, which can be accomplished with weather stripping, which we'll talk about when we discuss windows. It is also important to remember that the goal is to reduce the amount of air infiltration while still allowing the house to breathe as it was designed to and to help avoid accumulating moisture. Insulation. Now, insulation is a tricky subject. So can anybody tell me what the goal of insulation is? Well, I'll tell you. The purpose of insulation is to slow down the transfer of heat. I can't tell people are raising their hands, so I don't know. Diane is raising her hand, but that might be old from the last question. 
Diane, what's the insula what, what, what's the uh, goal of insulation? I don't know if you can unmute yourself. All right. Well, oh. to pro to provide a barrier to keep the hot air and cold air from coming in. That's that's correct. I mean, the, it's the purpose is to slow down the transfer of heat. So most houses were not insulated prior to 1940, and if they were, it was with things like newspaper or brick nogging. Insulation is commonly rated by R factor, the resistance to transferring heat. The higher the number, the better it insulates. As with air leaks, there are areas within ho historic homes that are good places to start to insulate. And in many homes, these places may already have been insulated post-construction or during a past, during a past renovation. Uh, they include the basement, attic, pipes, and ducts. Uh, the benefit of starting here is that there are typically no historic finishes to be disturbed and they're usually easy to do overall. They're not complicated. There is a variety of insulation material to choose from, each with different R values and different applications. As with air sealing, spray foams are not reversible and should not be used on historic fabric. Also like air sealing, there is the question of moisture buildup when ins insulating a structure. As heat is not passing as easily through the structure, exterior materials may remain colder and wetter for longer, which may lead to more maintenance and or deterioration. Specifically, wall installation in a historic home is problematic as something, that has, as something has to be removed to allow for its installation. This, depending on the type of insulation, could be a small cut into plaster, the removal of exterior shingle, or a not recommended whole scale removal of wall finishes. If too much insulation is added to an existing wall cavity, plaster wall systems can fail, evidenced by broken keys or lat. Additionally, most historic structures often contain a wall cavity that helps to keep interior wall systems dry. Adding insulation can sometimes cause unintentional moisture problems and rot. Consequently, wall insulation um, will no longer provide a break between the exterior wall and the interior wall and, and not allow for airflow to help it dry, which may create moisture problems and or material deterioration. On our window. Uh, this is one of my favorite things. It's one of, what, one of the things we get the most questions about. Um, you can learn a lot about a building in a very short amount of time by looking at its windows. In addition to the cultural value they hold, historic windows offer a number of benefits. They are often made of quality materials by quality craftsmen. They are repairable multiple times. They are custom made for your house and they provide an aesthetic quality that new windows can't. Uh, so if all of this is true, why do so many houses have replacement windows? Much like an aluminum uh, siding salesman would walk down the street going door to door, I'm sure you have all have seen window salesmen do the same. Um, and, you know, there's been a national kind of trend with uh, window salesmen for the last 20 years, and it's even gone through le national legislation about allowing uh, window salesmen to do their thing. And the push to kind of defend that um, is usually from nonprofits. Even national nonprofits don't have that, uh, that you know, you know uh, uh, list of lawyers that they can call to go, go try to fight these things. So it's very important um, to recognize how important these windows are. And uh, one of the things I'm not sure if we have in here is, is one of the most important things about windows is the material. And I, I mentioned it a little, but the wood is old growth wood. And that wood is much more dense than the new wood that you're getting and even new replacement wood windows. And it lasts so much more long, so much longer. Um, so it's something to consider when you have this old material, it's, it wasn't made on a farm to get, you know, you know, trees weren't grown super fast with as much water and nutrients as you can get, so you can get it big enough to make wood. These are old growth, original trees that grew slowly over decades and decades. Um, and they're just simply more dense and resistant to uh, failure. So window salesman, hey, uh, your windows look a bit shabby. They're not energy efficient. Uh, those aluminum storms aren't very appealing. Our windows were approved by the his local store commission. 
Uh, that last one gets me. Um, it's possible that this type of scenario contributes to the number of houses that have replacement windows. All those statements sound reasonable. And in fact, they may have been approved by a local store district commission. That sounds right. Um, but you have to know the facts about replacement windows. Um, and how would you counter that? So there are our counter to all those statements and they include one that they may not be new, but they work. A properly weatherized window with a storm functions effectively like a new insulated window. Aluminum storms are effective. They do not require any major investment if they're already there. They are environmentally friendly and protect the historic window. And again, new wood, new windows are not made the same as the original windows. The wood they are made out of is less dense. They provide comparatively uh, comparable energy efficiency to the existing window at a, a significant cost. Each unit has a finite lifespan span and is not repairable. And they are not custom made to match the existing windows in material, paint configuration, size, and month and profile. They will adversely affect the integrity of a National Register property. Or to put it simply, you windows are inferior to the ones I already have. Replacement windows are the last resort. They are there to replace what's been lost. If you have windows that are in good shape or simply need some small repairs, there is no need to replace them. And in fact, replacement for sustainability sake isn't all that effective. A single pane double hung wood window has an approximate R value of one. A new double pane insulated window has an R value of approximately three. Unless you are in Wheel of Fortune, Two R's just aren't worth that much. One of the main benefits of retaining historic windows is the practical, practicality of repair. Almost el any element can be fixed. Contemporary windows are units. That is, they are a closed system. And once that is damaged, it's almost impossible to repair. Additionally, windows are almost always character defining features of a building. You can see that there are a plethora of window types indicative of different eras and styles. This is a list of 10 reasons why it's a good idea to keep historic windows. We've already talked about some of them, so I'm not going to read the whole list, but highlights include, they are more economical, they are greener, they are functional, and they're absolutely unique. And before we move on, I'll just say, you know, there's plenty of studies and we have a number of them that are in our energy efficiency book on our website uh, that documents that even if you buy new windows, before you break even on your investment is like 20 to 30 years. And then those new windows will need to be replaced. So when you're considering replacement windows, look at the numbers hard. So uh, what can you do to immediately improve the energy efficiency of your historic windows? You can do window draft stoppers, insulated shades or, or curtains, rope cock, or window draft shields. And above all, general maintenance. Paint wood sashes, spot filled with uh, glazing putty, keep the sashes sliding smoothly, and monitor the sash cords and replace them if necessary. There are more intensive energy efficiency measures that should be undertaken by a professional, including uh, weather stripping, including metal and storm windows. Both of these items need to be custom fitted for the best result. So it's a good idea to get some, someone experienced. Uh, Preservation Connecticut, formerly the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation is our statutory statewide nonprofit preservation uh, partner. And they have a directory of professionals on their website uh, sorted by category. Doors are similar to windows. They are often character defining and examples of bygone craftsmanship. In any case, the same reasons for keeping historic windows apply to doors. Better materials, custom fit, less waste and unique to your house. And just like windows, people are going to come around and suggest that you replace them. This is an actual mailer that I got <laughs> in, in my mailbox. Um, 
this was after I had a conversation with the window salesman and I think they were the same company. So I think rather than ring the doorbell and try and give me the pitch, they just, they just decided to put the flyer in my mailbox. Cause I didn't, I don't think they wanted to, uh, to have that debate again. You get yelled at again. It wasn't yelled. It was a debate. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, the same treatment for windows are similar for doors and include regular maintenance, such as painting and patching and the installation of weather stripping. There's also the option of a storm door, which should be uh, chosen carefully so as not to detract from the historic door if possible. And again, um, maintaining your windows and doors is huge, uh, and as well as uh, installing weather stripping. Again, if you do that, those historic windows and doors will be just as energy efficient as a new product. So we talked earlier about the inherent energy saving features that were built into historic homes, partly because fuel sources weren't as plentiful and modern cooling didn't exist. Now that these systems do exist, many people have grown accustomed to them. Given also the discussion we had about insulation and moisture, it is not the wisest idea to create an interior space that is 50 degrees when the exterior temperature is 90 degrees. That's a bit of an hyperbolic example, but the general principle is the same. Extreme temperature differences can adversely impact building fabric. It is possible to create climate controlled spaces in historic homes, but it's unrealistic. And as we referenced earlier about breathability, often undesirable to expect to create a hermetically sealed environment with a new HVAC system. What should be desired and expected is to integrate a system into a home by using inherent climate control characteristics coupled with new reversible technology. Generally, installing new pipes or ductwork should be avoided, especially if there is infrastructure already in place that can be retrofitted. As an example, the furnace shown on the left is a natural gas furnace slash hot water heater, which is connected to existing radiators. The only major change to improve the efficiency here was to remove the oil burning furnace and the conventional hot water tank. In regards to cooling, where there is no existing ductwork to use, high velocity mini ducts are an option as they have smaller and flexible ductwork compared to the traditional um, seam metal and require less intervention into historic fabric. And if seasonal cooling is desired, which as Marx Twain said, if you don't like the weather in New England, just wait, Room air conditioners, which vent through a small tube out a window, are more effective at cooling and do not damage any historic fabric. So we've just gone over a lot of ways about how to conserve energy. And now let's talk about ways that we can produce energy using alternative sources. Ah, uh, solar. Significant question when it comes to energy efficiency is the introduction of solar. It has both detractors and supporters. A typical residential solar installation relies on solar voltaic panels, usually installed on a roof, uh, but it could also be installed on a ground mounted array. Solar installations have the possibility to negatively impact ground and below ground historic or cultural resources. Therefore, placement becomes key. General guidance is that panels, if installed on buildings, should be placed on a non-public facing slope uh, or you know, on the side or the rear or placed on a non-historic structure like an addition or a non-historic outbuilding like a garage. In this example, you can see the front slope of the X uh, example is, would be what we'd call an adverse effect. Whereas the other example, um, it's on the side. For ground mounted arrays, they should be placed in an area that will not disrupt, disrupt a scenic view. And the area, if not already disturbed, should be evaluated for its potential to contain archeological deposits. Geothermal heat pumps are another possible option for renewable energy in homes. They rely on the earth's constant temperature for heating and utilize less energy than conventional furnace systems. Like ground mounted solar arrays, the area of installation should be evaluated for any archeological sensitivity before installation. There are other types of renewable energy, including one of the oldest, wind power, hydropower, and biomass fuel. 
but these are typically outside the realm of a single homeowner, but our guide also includes information on each type. Above all, it is important to remember that technology is ever evolving and that elements introduced into a structure may soon become obsolete and need to be removed or cause unforeseen conditions. As an example, this is a monster of a furnace, but many homes were built with this type of heating system around the beginning of the 20th century. And this is the space in my home where this type of furnace used to be located. Um, that photo on the left shows a parge chimney stack where a, their, a vent uh, connected to it. So that um, chimney stack actually comes out right here behind me. Uh, <laughs> um, but at some point that furnace was converted from coal to oil. And then uh, it was converted from oil to the natural gas furnace on the right. However, if you notice, all of this infrastructure took place in the basement and did not create any new ductwork, or if it did, it created ductwork that was out in the open and did not disturb any historic fabric. All right, uh, but what about this? Those cuts were made for a very specific air conditioning unit. And once it wears out, like Marina's furnace did, what replaces it? Do you make another intervention? Uh, you can't put it back. Uh, historic fabric that has been lost for the sake of a 30 year appliance at best is not the best way to move forward. My house was here long before me and hopefully it will be here long after I'm gone. As a steward of a historic property, I enjoy my house but I also have a responsibility to take care of it, just like you have a responsibility to take care of yours. And I also feel a responsibility to be sustainable. And I'm sure many of you feel the same way. Luckily, being sustainable and being historic go hand in hand. All right, so we've gone through a lot of material. So before embarking on energy upgrades, let's summarize the main points. Decide what you want to accomplish. Understand the historic character of your home. Evaluate current conditions and create a holistic plan that is primarily reversible. All right, so there's a mu much more to read about, uh, about sustainability in our handbook, which you can find on our website right here, um, as well as additional guidance from the National Park Service at uh, mps.gov. This is just a jumping off point. Uh, we hope you found this helpful, and if you have any questions, uh, we're at the bag end. It's a the Hobbit. It's a Hobbit reference. Uh, so feel free to ask away. Thank you. We have one question so far, far um, for one of you, which is what would be the best kind of insulation to use in an attic to insulate the roof? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of, of options you can look at. I mean, again, you know, even, you know, I mean, there is loose blown uh, cellulose that you lay on the floor of the attic. Um, but, you know, you can even put in regular, you know, uh, the Pink Panther stuff into the rafters because it's reversible. Um, uh, you know, you, you could talk to uh, an insulation uh, uh, installer about what the options are. But again, as long as it's reversible, it's not a problem. And they have different levels of R value that you get. But, but one of the most important things you can do in a historic house is insulate that roof because heat rises. So um, it, it's an easy fix and, and it's, it's one that's gonna make a big difference. Yeah, and, and you know, it's hard to recommend one product because as we mentioned, every resource is unique and each resource is, is going to have different conditions in their house because houses change and evolve over time. And even if you have two very similar houses that are built in a very similar design, they have been treated differently. And so for one house, the idea, it may make the most sense to actually insulate the attic floor. 
if there's no attic floor and it's actually open and you just have a plaster ceiling, it may actually be easier to put in bat insulation and leave that attic space unclimate controlled and keep and concentrate your climate controls on the actual living spaces. For others, as Todd mentioned, it may be easier to insulate uh, the roof in between the rafters, um, either using a rigid board insulation or something like that. But it's important to make sure that when you're planning this, you're also cognizant of what these changes are going to do. And for, so for instance, um, you know, sometimes people insulate their roofs and again, there's no space to breathe and that ends up creating um, an influx of moisture and then you start getting ice dams. Um, you know, and so that's something that you all want to be cognizant of and you want to express those concerns when you first do that energy audit, which is the first thing to do is make sure that you have a baseline before you start making any changes. Yeah, one of the benefits of the energy audit is it, it'll spell out clearly exactly where your biggest losses are, which mm -hmm. is where you should put your, 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 your most energy in the beginning. You may find that uh, it's going out the roof. Um, you may find that you have, uh, uh, you know, incorrect, um, you know, uh, insulation of maybe a window and it, it's going out that hole. So th that information is really key to get a good understanding of how to, to put your resources to, to getting a good energy efficient home. Great. Uh, we have another question. Um, are there grant funds or rebates in order to help pay for removal of toxic barriers to energy efficiency assessments such as asbestos, mold, lead pipes, and paint? So there are. Um, there's a couple of different things. The first um, resource that we would point you to is um, Sustainable CT. Um, and they're the partner organization, Connecticut Green Bank. Um, they provide funding and loans, depending on what sort of funding, the, you know, the rounds change, depending on what funding is available. Um, and they can have an energy auditor um, come out and perform the energy audit. Usually those people are familiar with working with any sort of materials that may be hazardous. Our guide does have um, some caveats to be cognizant of and to notify um, the auditor to be aware of before you do that energy audit. And then there is also state funding that is available for remediation of some of those hazardous materials because they sometimes often go hand in hand with the initial goals of the project. So those are often eligible expenses. Um, yeah, and I would say that, you know, we also have, our, our office has a program called um, an historic home tax credit. So if your house is listed on the state or national register um, and it's, a home, it's owner occupied, uh, up to four units, you can apply for that. And that could be used for rehab, restoration, and energy efficiency as long as it follows the Secretary of the Interior Standards. And I'd also suggest you reach out to your municipality to see if they have any programs that is often uh, federally funded. Great, here's a question about bulkhead doors. Um, are metal bulkhead doors to enter a basement uh, that much better than wood doors, assuming the wood door isn't rotten? So that's an interesting question, um, but it goes back to the principles that we started at as the beginning is it's really, as you're kind of alluding to, it's really about the maintenance of the material. If you have a bulkhead that happens to be wood, but it's not rotten and it's properly painted, and it is also properly weather stripped the door itself, there are no air leaks, there are no gaps, it should function essentially the same. Um, you know, at, at, although I will say that, you know, most bulkhead doors at this point um, that we often find, including my own, um, are now metal. Um, and I actually can tell you that the metal one I have is not properly weatherized. Um, it's, it's, a, okay. it's a little shabby and I should probably consider weatherizing it and or replacing it because it is not, it was not properly maintained. So shame on me. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah so I mean, you know, you know theoretically, if if you're going to get a new one, I mean, a bulkhead that's already been replaced, you want to replace it again, it's not going to adversely affect your, your uh, historic integrity. Uh, I too have a metal one and it also is not particularly well uh, weatherized, but I also have a door at the bottom. So to, you, you should make sure if it's not well done to do some some steps to, to make it better because you, you will be losing, uh, especially if you have a finished basement, um, heat out that, that, um, uh, that space. Yeah, Great. but um, you know, I'll also say that it is similar a little bit to um, a vestibule. 
So the idea is that you want that interior door to really be your, your barrier and you have that intermediary space. So that's something to also kind of consider if you're going to use it to function like that. You do want to make sure it's weatherized properly, weather, weatherized properly maintained, but that it has that bit of a flow because that's going to be your break between, especially as Todd mentioned, if you have a finished basement or you have a bulkhead access to a finished space, that's going to be a good spot where you want to have that slow down of transfer of heat. Okay, we have a roof question. Um, our okay i have a question about cedar shake for roofing a cedar roof which needs replacement do you re recommend replacing with cedar or new roofing material yeah that's a great question um you know obviously uh there is uh, a preference and the preference would be replace historic material in kind which would be another uh wood shake roof um you know roofs are replaceable they they generally have a 30-year lifespan um you know uh I'm a proponent of, uh, you know, certainly replacing in kind. Um, you know, my, my colleague and I have had, you know, spirited conversations about replacement material um, and what is appropriate and what isn't it. But the Secretary of the Interior Standards that are provided by the National Park Service is, is our, our guiding light. Um, and, you know, they basically say replace in kind if you can for roofs. Um, you could use, uh, you know, 30 year, you know, our, you know, archaeological, uh, archaeological, architectural shingles, um, but it, it, it's going to distract, detract from the historic significance of the building. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of the thing to make clear is that, you know, we follow the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. That is the SHPO's guidance. That is the guidance that is approved for all of our programs, be it environmental compliance or any sort of financial incentives that our office offers through grants or tax and, or uh, tax credit programs. Um, I will also say that for the homeowner, they should really evaluate what, again, going back to the beginning, what is our goal here? Is it because the cedar shakes have reached the end of their life? Is it because a portion of it is performing well, a portion of it is not? And then they can kind of make that choice. What, what again, we'll also kind of mention as we previously said is technology is always evolving and always changing. And kind of as we alluded to in that aluminum siding thing, aluminum siding was sold as the answer to all your painting prayers. You would never have to paint your house again. You could just clad it. But we all know that when you did that and later when vinyl came along, same sort of thing, you were basically saran wrapping your house and you created a little crock pot out of your house and all those exterior materials that were left under there when they decided to insulate and put the vinyl siding on, two things happened. Either they ripped off all the original siding so you lost a huge amount of historic fabric that is irreplaceable and you can never get back or that just rotted underneath the vinyl siding. And so now when your vinyl siding has reached the end of its finite lifespan, you tear it off, now you have an even bigger problem underneath. So the goal is always to make sure that you're making a choice that's appropriate to you and the use of your home, but also being cognizant of what that may do to the structure in the future. Okay, um, do you have any tips for securing contractors who are familiar with and respectful of historic homes? Yeah, so I would start with our statutory partner, the uh, Preservation Connecticut. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I'm not sure what their website is called. They just, they were Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation when I worked there. And I see Mimi it's, uh, Findlay. PreservationCT.org. Yeah, there you go. I see Mimi Findlay, who was on the board of trustees when I was there. Hi, Mimi. Um, anyway, so yeah, I would start with them. They have a list of contractors. You can talk to actually staff there and they can help you. Uh, find contractors either on their own list or give you questions to ask. Anytime I want to hire a contractor to do, you know, work in an historic home, um, I ask for references. Have you worked in a historic home like this? You, you, you need to demonstrate to me, even if you're a regular contractor, um, that you've done this kind of work on a historic home so that you don't make mistakes. Uh, so yeah, I would start with Preservation Connecticut, but even if, if they can't help you, I would go, you know, call your contractors and ask for references for buildings that they worked on that are historic. And if they can't provide them, uh, move on. Okay, here we have, if your home has certain areas that have been poorly updated, 
is it worthwhile to replace with historic materials? Um, well, yes, and it depends exactly what you mean, but let's say you have, uh, when, I, I guess I would need a clarification of what you Yeah, Re Rebecca, do you have an example that maybe you could share? Yeah, because, okay, windows. so windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, if you have window replacements, if you have vinyl windows, that someone put in prior to you getting the house or you did or whatever, or mom and dad did. Um, yeah, going back to a, a wood window is certainly preferable. There's actually um, uh, salvage companies that, that when buildings are getting demoed, uh, they, they will go there and collect the historic fabric so that they can you know, reuse them so they don't go to the dump. And you'd be able, if you had to replace like two windows, obviously you don't want to you know, get custom made windows for, uh, you know, it's, just, it's, just, it's hard to do. You might want to go to some of these uh, places that have salvage windows uh, and get one that matches. Yeah, and it's, and um, again, you know, from the perspective of our office, um, you know, putting back what has already been lost, um, that's why we stress retain when you can, because it is true, while you can get new custom replacements, that are approximate, they will never be the perfect fit that the original windows were. And so it really is they're once they're gone, they're gone. They can't come back. Um, but if you are interested or if you're in a position where, as Todd mentioned, you have vinyl windows and they're reaching the end of their lifespan, um, it may be more appropriate for you to choose something that is more historically sympathetic to the house while also being able to perform better than the windows that you that you had um and and as you know and salvage is something that you know we we you know if we're dealing with a project we don't usually advocate again it's a last resort type of thing um but that is something where you would be able to get a product that um you know you it avoids going to the landfill and it's made out of a more quality material than the stuff that is currently available Anyone else have any uh, questions to ask? Uh, well, if you guys do in the future, you certainly can reach out to Marina or mm -hmm. I uh, about any general questions. Uh, if we always provide technical assistance uh, whenever, and we're happy to help uh, anytime we can. And again, we do have a couple of, of, of financial incentives if you're listed on the state or national register. Uh, with our historic home tax credit. Yeah, I'm going to put up our, um, our contact information. Oh, yes, that is very helpful. Thank you. All right. Yeah, and if you have, you know, if you have a question, please, you know, don't, don't feel embarrassed about asking. It. Ask whatever you want. Well, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, and uh, Allison, do you want to add to that? Yeah, um, am I on? Yes. yes. Um, I wanted to um, thank uh, Marina and Todd. This has been absolutely terrific. I love getting this kind of really detailed granular information. You can really go home, think it over and start someplace actionable. I like that, thank you. Um, just a reminder that this video was recorded, so you can come back and see it another time. It will be on the Wilton Historical website uh, within the next day or two. And as Todd and Marina mentioned, they have uh, lots of information that's on the websites as, that have been discussed. And uh, I've looked at the uh, document they have. It's very, very useful, and I, I encourage you to take a look at that. And I uh, just wanted to thank everyone for coming. Um, we love seeing you and having you be part of the Wilton Historical presentations and programs. Come back and visit us for more stuff, great stuff. And um, we'll wait to see you the next time. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Wait, there's, there's another question. Oh, a uh -oh. question. Oh, how, let's, how to let's register, take yeah, How to register an historic home in Connecticut. And luckily, you guys have Marina Wisniewski. <laughs> <laughs> who actually is the state register coordinator. 
Marina? So first, uh, Donna, what's your address? We'll do it live. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm oh, here. Oh, hi, Donna. Hi. <laughs> I'm so uh, excited. Yeah, I'm in Wilton. I'm on yep. a historic road, 782 Ridgefield Road. Let's find out. <laughs> in Wilton. <laughs> yeah, you may already be listed and not even know it. That's, yeah. that's why I'm asking. So you no. may already be. 782 Ridgefield Road? Yes. Let's find out. The power of technology. <laughs> uh, I would like to make a comment, though, about uh, modern conveniences destroying a historic home because this happened in my house. When I bought my antique farmhouse, it looked like the house was collapsing in the middle of the farmhouse. It, it was all like all the all the floorboards seemed to be going down. Mm. And the uh, inspector thought that it was just because the house had settled. We realized probably 10 years into living here that what had happened was when they put in the new furnace, probably back in the 20s, right in the center of the house, they actually cut some of the support beams out. Beam. Yeah. yeah. And oh. that's what we put, you know, my screwed <laughs> it out and we, you know, we stabilized it. Yeah. But there was nothing wrong with this house. It had not settled. It, yeah. Yeah. it collapsed the center because of the uh, work that had been done for the furnace. I'm not saying it shouldn't have a furnace, but somebody who didn't know what they were doing obviously had. Um... Yeah, yeah. So, you know, sometimes that's one of the reasons that, you know, again, is to make sure that you have a baseline. One of the things that we didn't mention because it wasn't particularly part of, um, oh, what a lovely home. Um, one of the things we, um, it is not listed at the moment, Donna, um, but this is how, if you're interested in listing your building on either the state or national register, uh, you reach out, you can reach out to me or our national oh. register coordinator, Jenny Schofield. And what we ask is that you give some representative photos. So a picture of each of the sides of the house, <laughs> and then a picture of, um, the interior spaces of the house. Jenny okay. and I work together to make sure we find the best fit. Um, you know, because we have the state register and then we have the national register. Um, I, and sometimes houses are significant and, and have enough integrity to be on the national register. Sometimes they don't quite meet that mark, but we have the state register. And yeah. both of those um, designations are eligible to help homeowners apply for our uh, homeowner tax credit program. So it opens you up to financial incentives. Um, yeah. So um, you have my contact email. So just shoot me an email with some photos and we can get that started if you're interested. Yeah, um, no, I agree. Marina that, and uh, Donna and Marina, D Donna's house is on our historic resource inventory. So we already have a really good write up that can be submitted. Wonderful. Yeah. Perfect. Now, and thank you too about the Cedar Shake because uh, when we did <laughs> the addition on, we put on Cedar Shake, we took off the architectural shingle and we put on Cedar Shake over the whole house. And I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was a massive expense and we kept wondering yep. <laughs> we were doing it for aesthetic reasons so it's kind of a relief to know we did the right thing yeah for sure for well, sure i mean and it looks so much better it's the original material yes uh, you know and it, it really makes a difference you know but Cute. you know but if times are tough and money's a crunch uh, you yeah. know, you could do, you know, the architectural and, right. you know, you know, and, and, you know, and some people even do, you know, metal roofs. I mean, that is not really, you know, appropriate for historic homes, but for a bar, you know, an outbuilding and certainly barns. I know Marina has very strong feelings about uh, a metal roof. So I like to kind of river a little bit, um, but metal, metal roofing has a very um, long history in the development of American architecture. Um, but uh, current metal roofs um, are, are not really part of that um, part of that genealogy. Um, right. They're kind of a new thing. 
But um, again, you know, it's a new kind of technology that we're evaluating. But in the future, Donna, you know, and for anybody who has a historic home and is thinking of doing any rehabilitation work, we do have a homeowner tax credit program. It's actually not a tax credit, it's a rebate. The credit is bought by a corporation and they issue you a check and it's 30% of your eligible expenses. So okay. if you'd like to check, if you're planning a rehabilitation project and you'd like to see if you're listed or if you'd like to get listed in order to be able to take advantage of that 30%, feel free to reach out. I will, no, I will. Thank you very much for that because we do need to do some work on the barn too. And the barn <laughs> from falling apart it had leaks water was getting in but we saved the structure so yeah reach out to us and we, we could chat offline yeah for sure yeah, thank please you please do it's very good thank you okay i think we've gotten to the end here so <laughs> glad donna put in that last question that was a good one led to lots of more good information all righty I think we're done, so thank you all again, and we hope to see you at a program soon.